Welcome to the Trash Cats Trash Cast. I'm Richard. I'm Steven. And today we're talking to our resident drug enthusiast, your friend and mine, Steven. That's me. That's you. I'm a drug addict. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you are, Steven. And you know what you get? A spot drugs? on a podcast. <laughs> no, no drugs. Damn. You don't get those. <laughs> Bomber. <laughs> How was your week, man? Been good. Uh, my dad's up here visiting, so we've been hanging out, getting some Halloween shit together, because uh, it is that time of the month. and <laughs> <laughs> It's the candy part of the month. And uh, yeah, it's been good. It's been a nice, chill week. Yeah. How about you? Uh, mixed bag. I got some shitty news earlier, but overall, doing all right. Just trying to stay busy, trying to work on art. It is not going great, but... I got some cool stuff in the work, so I'm doing okay. Just okay. Fuck yeah. Yeah. So I know you have some honorables for us today. Yeah. All right. These these will give me away a bit. Uh, new, new-ish movie. I think it's been out for a little bit, but it reminded me of you. It's on Netflix. It's a stop motion. It's done by three directors in three separate parts that are used as a vehicle to tell one story. It's called The House. Okay. It's really fun. It, it's one of those ones where it gets so abstract, it feels like so important and meaningless at the same time. But mm-hmm. it's, it's some really cool art, and it's a really fun watch. Good one to watch with someone. It's really funny. and It uh, looks very trippy. It's it's. It's really good, man. You'll enjoy it a lot. People aren't familiar too much with the genre. Tim Burton esque, if very different, but in that in that realm, r- really cute at moments and funny, but also very dark. Like it, it, there was a moment where it gets so psychological horror esque that I was like, "Fuck, I don't know if I want to watch this." I was like, <laughs> so I was just trying to like chill out. Then I was like, "Fuck, am I going to get scared of some?" <laughs> Some puppets right now, but it, it <laughs> it's worth the watch for sure. And then uh, second one, th- this is the one I'm more embarrassed about. So we we just <laughs> listened to it before starting. This is NLE Choppa. All right, now this is one of these new age youngster rappers. And the youngster rappers. <laughs> <laughs> the video is no lie. Video's garbage. Done really well, high production, but like lame rap shit. But what's so interesting about this particular track to me is that it has real bass, like bass guitar, Mm -hmm. doesn't really have drum, it has snare, but it's not like trap drums. It's just the bass beat, basically. And to me, it represents everything cool and really shitty about new rap music. And, And I just find... That combination is so interesting because there's there's so much cool stuff happening, and then there's so much of it that's ruined by just like cars, money, bitches, like that whole mentality. And yeah, this yeah. this is like such a <laughs> juxtaposition of that because it it is like just some of the coolest parts, the soul sample and really unique high production beats and like mm-hmm. hype energy with all of the lame parts of hip-hop and rap too so it's something worth checking out I'm not saying it's what i love but it's interesting yeah. this this is one of those examples of like if it was in another language i would enjoy it more mm-hmm. it's like the energy in the verses were good yeah just because the the content was changing the way i feel about the song yeah the the instrumental was was really dope i Said it, I don't think it's exactly like this, but it reminds me of a an old cheesy beat. Yeah, of like you know, it's kind of grandiose with the the soul thing, and you know the the heavy bass. Um, the without the drum is really interesting. I think that's cool. I love when music takes out the drum because they're doing something really powerful that they don't need it. That's like yeah, yeah. And and this was like it's a really poppy one. It's not like he he's in the drill realm, but he's not. This is like poppy hip hop, but it's it's interesting. But I will say as a sign, 
of a music video, anytime a girl's butt is got cake and icing on it, it's probably not like an amazing <laughs> piece of art. <laughs> I mean, funny. you know, yeah, I'm, I'm the, with uh, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying it's art, but I'll watch it. <laughs> <laughs> funny stuff. So, what are we doing today? So today, I have um, you. You were the one that introduced me to the series of Soft White Underbelly. Good stuff. And for the longest time, I've been, you know, I've been, I subscribe to the channel, and I'll get the the videos. That come up and I'll usually, I'll start watching them a little bit and then they make me sad. So I typically <laughs> turn them off. But <laughs> but you have to start every one and see if it hooks you. Because no, yeah, ma- yeah, no yeah. matter who it is or what the topic is, people's stories can somehow captivate you. Like there's something yeah. you can like find or learn from anyone. Even if even if most of them suck, oh. there, there's always a chance it's outstanding. Almost all of them captivate me a little bit, and that's the thing where like I get, I get invested, and then it's like, wow, this is extremely, you know, like mm, mm, let's say ninety five percent of the time, it's like this is just extremely sad mm-hmm. to watch because it's a person in a bad situation, and the, you know, it's when it's very humanizing in the way that you get to look behind, you know, the the fentanyl junkie and look at this human that is you know as a life and has made choices and those choices have put them in a a place that they can't get out of and you know even when they try and they it's like it's it's real fucked yeah but what i learned from that is there's a the whole world of you know drug addiction especially that i just don't have a lot of knowledge in and i think a lot of people don't just from a lack of experience and i think to further understand that um and especially on a personal basis with you my my who i would call my best friend um i would like to ask you you know some questions and hopefully you can educate me enlighten me I feel like this is going to be a sting. Like as soon as we finish recording and I go to walk upstairs, it's going to be like a, the catch a predator. Like the cops are going to be yeah. in the house. Like, gotcha. <laughs> Chris Hansen's already in your house, bud. <laughs> Would you like some cookies and lemonade? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before you go to jail. No, we'll, we'll make it fun. I Honestly, I feel like more and more people, I, I feel like more and more people understand elements of this because like everyone knows someone that's dead or like fucked up from this shit but it it is such a it's such an isolating thing to be like super in super junkie mode that i while i feel like a ton of people see parts of it they it's a it's a different life different world so i don't know yeah i i feel slightly all cards on the table I feel, I don't feel anxious at all because I feel very comfortable speaking with you, but I feel apprehensive in the way where um, I feel like a lot of my takeaways from this, like, you know, most people who get sober or whatever, it's like they, they find God, they hate drugs, or they, it's like a whole weird twist. And a lot of my takeaways are so antithetical to that where Mm -hmm. i'm not necessarily sure like i have a like a positive message to say at all right yeah i feel like a lot of people look at that as like there's one there's there's a one true answer to you know sobriety or like the in general with healthcare issues you know like depression and shit too like Mm -hmm. there's a one answer way to solve it and it's like there's not everyone's different everyone can can gain or benefit from different things and you know certain things aren't as you know effective for certain people and it's i i think that's something that's lost on people that don't have any experience with that of like you know even dieting dieting is a huge one of like when people are like oh i need to lose weight and it's like oh you just eat less and exercise more and it's like that's easy to say but like getting into that habit and it's like oh well just you know, uh, you know, the schedule this time, it's like, it's, it's on a realistic point of view. It's different shit works for different people. 
different practices. Definitely. And I would say at the root base of that, there's two big differences between myself and a lot of people or, or myself and the main narrative of thought. I feel like you're, you're told that you don't get sober alone, that you should be using every resource and you do it through helping other people, fi- finding groups, all that shit. And mm-hmm. then the other half is like a power greater than yourself. And those are like the two big things, like every fucking professional, every fucking lame ass commercial, every fucking AA group. That's, that is like the way you get sober. And I, I see how that can work for a lot of people, but I, I feel like you're supposed to figure these things out alone. And I, yeah, I, I think definitely for you, I can see the self dependency thing being much a, a stronger resource for you than, you know, like I feel like just on knowing you and your personality type that any kind of reliance on another person, especially is, is like a defeat to you. But I didn't used to be that way. Like I always, I always played, I I always played that role, but like Mm -hmm. at my worst, I was so, so fucking weak all the fucking time. And it, it like, to me, that was so upsetting every six to eight hours to need to have to buy something from people I hated to feel yeah. slightly better or or to need someone's phone number to not be throwing up all, all those different parts of or the people I put in my life because I needed them to like help me be stable enough so I could keep getting my shit like even if that was like s- such the opposite of what I believed so but I also feel like e- even if you're in those weak places, you still have to figure it all out yourself. And everyone tells you that's not what you're supposed to do a lot of the time. So let me ask you this, you know, during that time when you were very dependent on so many other people for that, did you feel like you were dependent on those people? Or was that like a realization yeah, afterward? Yeah. Uh, so let me, let me frame this. And then uh, how about kick it off wherever you want to start? So what I'll say is, before I ever started using, like, I wanted to be a heroin addict. Like, that's, like, I knew that's what I always wanted to, I, before I'd ever, like, drank or anything. I was like, I want to, like, die, like, I want to <laughs> die like a fucking rock star, like Kurt Cobain, whatever. Like, I don't give a fuck about my life. I want to just be drugs like i thought that was right going to be super cool and like i i feel like that first year of like heavy use it was like no that you know i'm completely in control still fucking gangster like the shit can't fuck with me and then you watch everyone around you fall really far into addiction and they still think that and i remember really fucking early on i was like no this shit is going to be my master i don't give a fuck this shit is so much better than anything i'll ever do or figure out i'm okay with riding (laughs) shotgun to wherever the fuck this takes me and i remember feeling like just super super not in control and kind of loving that for a while for a while so let me ask you this do you hmm what well, what do you think was the first do you ever notice any type of you know a, the the addictive behavior i know you've talked about it in the past of like a, a addictive uh personality type maybe or like a addictive um you know mindset that you you kind of have what what was the first n- notion that you maybe thought of that like was it like a a sugar thing? Was it like something when you were a kid, something like that? Or was it like <laughs> straight to, you know, let's, let's fucking go do some heroin. That's a, exactly what came to mind is like fucking Halloween candy. Like <laughs> dude, I can't eat like half a bag of like those mini Skittles or some shit. Mm-hmm. Like I, I will 
as a kid, like I'll sit down and eat a half pound bag of Skittles. Like I don't, whatever it is, like I would get sick from eating too many grapes. Whatever, whatever I liked, there was no, there was no reason to stop. Like when I was younger, like before I could notice those things, it was like God shit. Like I was all in on God mode, full junkie for the Lord as a little kid. Like going to Catholic school. Junkie for the Lord. I was, I was. That's the name of the episode. I was hooked on that, <laughs> that Holy Spirit smack. And, uh, but like, can- <laughs> candy. I mean, my teeth are just fucked because of the. <laughs> it's not the drugs, it was the candy addiction. Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> and then before drugs, definitely was self mutilation stuff. I was extremely addicted, and I loved, I fucking loved that every fucking day. Like, just would fucking mangle myself. And then uh, that kind of spiraled into, like, body mods, like, trying to tattoo, like, you know, all the normal shit. And then Mm -hmm. quickly, like, the first time I got high, like, actually, even, like, the first 10 times I tried to get high, I didn't get high. But I, I, like, I didn't feel good from it i didn't do enough or like no i was fucked up but i just knew i kept wanting to (laughs) Mm -hmm. and the first time i ever caught a buzz off anything like before i'd the first time i ever even drank i bought a handful of percocets and like stole a bottle of wine like that was the first thing i ever did was oxy that's absolutely insane and and i was like so i remember being so scared because i you know, like, as a kid, you don't understand. Nothing's in perspective. Like, I thought if I had, like, one too many five milligram perks with a glass of wine, I might die in my sleep because I right. watched SLC Punk one time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. But, yeah, that was the first shit I ever tried. And then, you know, I was, I was off to the races so fucking quick after. Was that the first time you ever drank to try to get drunk? Yeah. That's wild. And was, you went straight for wine. Yeah. It was, so sophisticated. It was, it was just what was available. But yeah. <laughs> I think the I like first wine. time I ever drank, it was, you know, like in an attempt to get drunk was a mix of every liquor that my, I could find in uh, my aunt's pantry. Uh, and I made a, a kamikaze of all of them because I didn't want her to notice that some had been missing. So it was a little bit of whiskey. That's clever. A little clever. bit of gin, a yeah. little bit of vodka, a little triple sec, you kind of mix, mix <laughs> everything together. And that tasted terrible, of course. Dude, that's hilarious. So you mix in a little Kool-Aid with a little red Kool-Aid and it didn't make it like better, but it made it like palatable. You could kind of get it down. <laughs> Dude, that's so... Now, did you... Because back in the day, like, you couldn't get weed easy, like, when, no, we, were, when no. we were young, right? Mm-hmm. Like early high school shit, whatever. Did you get into, because I was, like, always an internet kid, too, like, downloading the newest anarchist cookbook, meth instructions, like, all that shit was on my Downloading desktop. all kinds of malware and spyware, oh, because, uh, constantly lime wire. <laughs> crashing a <laughs> shitty old Dell computer, because I had, yep. like... 200,000 LimeWire downloads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I would, uh, like, did you try any of the, like, the Banana Dine or Nutmeg, like, those, like, internet drug recipes and shit like that? Um, never did the Nutmeg. We we tried the um, Morning Glory seeds one yeah. time. And, like, tried to grind them up and you could get didn't f- fucking do anything. If you get the right ones, you can get fucked up, but it's... No, we did not. We got them from little, fucking Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a lot of the right shit. <laughs> it's a lot of fucking work. I remember trying to make Banana Dine a handful of times. And I try, I was trying to do... What's Banana Dine? It was, it was in the one of the old anarchist cookbooks, and it supposedly... There's some truth to it, but it's not really real. But it was... You would scrape the linings of banana peels, and that has everything has a psychedelic molecule in it, right? Mm-hmm, like there's mm-hmm. always something. People are licking toads is back now. People are doing oh, cool. toad extract acid and shit. But you could scrape the banana gunk from the peel and with a razor and like get a baking sheet 
and cook it at the right temperature. I think he mixed something else, but it, it to make like one, if it ever could work, it it would it took something like one ton of banana peels to make like <laughs> you know where it was like this. It, it, it was probably something like it, if it had any psychedelic properties at all, it was probably just because it would cause like kidney failure. That's how it's like the, the nutmeg thing of like, you're going to make yourself extremely so, sick before you get any effect off of this. Yeah. I remember you'd be better off taking like a couple Benadryls <sighs> and then maybe you yeah. might just get sleepy and go to sleep. You fucking teenager. Robo tripping. <laughs> I remember the yeah, robo, robo tripping. tripping. <laughs> I remember people in, uh, I lived at Hawaiian Terrace for a while, which was fucking wild. That was later on, but people collecting bed bugs and smoking them. Yeah, Some man, that was a thing. Grind. I didn't realize that that was real for the longest time. Right? I thought that was just a fucking inside joke that people were like, "Oh, you're smoking bed bugs." You know, like, are you are you fucking out of your mind? I don't know anyone that actually did it. It was more of like running joke i remember collecting bed bugs in a cd cases at one point <laughs> like having the different breeds and like we would joke like what strain do you want to smoke or yeah, but, sure. <laughs> but there there were straight up crap you get a a plastic like a soda bottle and you'd fill it up with sugar water like for a hummingbird and you put the straw you put a straw through the top mm-hmm. and angle it into the carpet and they would crawl in there and die and there would be people that some people just made those as traps in general but there are other people that would put a screen or whatever and collect the bed bugs up to grind up and smoke and be like fuck jesus how fucking Gnarly. how fucking hard is it for you to get weed this is why this is why we need that legalization of weed i've i i have such mixed feelings we've talked about that before yeah. I, I if it I, keeps yeah. people from smoking bed bugs I I'm just don't. For it. I just don't want the Fed selling weed. I just don't like that. Everything else is great. I love that I can make a better world or whatever. But also, when yeah, you're like, money goes to the schools and people aren't smoking bed bugs. But that's a better planet already. As someone that endorses open drug use, full decriminalization, everyone should try something at some point. I also don't think it's great for a government to sell weed because it, it's undeniable. Not that I think weed is a particular like devious gateway drug, but there's no way anyone who does drugs can say that a bunch of people that use weed because it, it's acceptable and our government sells mm-hmm. it. There's no way to say a ton of those kids aren't going to become drug addicts. Like, that, it, yeah. Now, now I will say this: the government doesn't sell weed; they just take a cut. It's the same shit. Just take a this take their their it's, fair it's share worse. to turn the other way. They I would take a rather bribe. They sell, I would rather they sell weed than just steal from other people selling it. Like it, what the fuck is happening? It's just no, they it, don't it, steal it. They just upcharge to cover the costs. Drugs are meant that to are be passed on to you. A black market for a reason. I just don't want taxes. Well, that's being but weed's not a drug. It is. Mm. It right? You can't say it's not a drug. I mean, it is, but. If, also, I can grow it in my backyard and roll it into a blunt. I mean, I, I'm for weed, but shit is potent. There's no way anyone can argue. Especially that new government weed. It's, I mean, it's crazy good That's shit. That's some crazy strong shit, man. I'm all for it, but I just don't want it from them. That's just... just That's fair. Yeah. I'm going to buy <sighs> weed from the cops, man. That's pretty fucked up. It's I've, Some trailer park boy shit. <laughs> That is always the worst when you know you're buying drugs and there's cops there. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not as bad as if you're selling drugs and there's cops there, but. And they looked at your ID already. They checked mm. in your ID. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, what was your, what was your initial pool to drugs? Depression, just mental illness shit. I. I, I never quite understand when people kill themselves without oh. trying drugs first. <laughs> or, or <Billy. laughs> because, hear me out. Here's the thing. Is like, no, I, I, 100, I agree with you. You're right. It, I, get, I do get that. It is a cure, right? It's a, it's a temporary mm. cure. No, ma- no matter how fucking mentally ill or depressed you are, drugs will make you feel better. They will make mm. you feel so much better. You will never feel that good again. 
and the rest yeah. of your life will suffer, right? Like, yeah. yeah. That, that's the reality. But I can't imagine just being like, oh, fuck it, I'm going to kill myself because I'm sad when I know there's something out there that's going to make me feel better than I've ever fucking felt. It'll make you feel better than dying. Right. I, I, I've thought of it as knowing it was going to fuck shit up, but this is a, a solution. It is a temporary solution, but it, it will buy me time. Like, I, I couldn't imagine trying to live life without it. Like, I, I feel like I'm one of the people that I'm so grateful I did drugs because there's no fucking way I would cho- have chosen to stay around this long. Like, it mm-hmm. f- fucked my shit up so bad, but it's what gave me, you know, part of its luck and part of its being smart. But I did what I had to do to, like, buy enough time to figure out how not to to need them. And that's that's a ton of luck. You know, a lot of people don't get that opportunity or that luck or whatever, but I, I, I don't know. I think for me, the only reason I used, it was just a, a symptom of severe depression and mental illness shit for sure. Was it, so would you say that before having even cons- like having considered trying them was like, where was the first, do you remember when you first like, got inspired by that. yeah i guess yeah like was, maybe something music, like a media music yeah, music yeah. A- any all the music i like glorified sex drugs and suicide right, right. There, there was i can think of songs drugs and suicide are great like <laughs> yeah, like yeah yeah that that's what all the art i was interested romanticized and i, I as an adult now i could look back and see how that isn't necessarily a good thing, but the only reason I was I was so inspired and driven to those medias was because I was that sick too. Like I, right. I was suffering that much that shit in that lane that romanticized it was so appealing. So like before I'd ever used drugs and knew I wanted to be a junkie, it was like fucking being a kid listening to Marilyn Manson or the, the Chili Peppers or yeah. whatever the fuck, whatever rapper it was that made that look so glorious. Yeah. For sure. Like, for example, like I've listened to not all the same stuff, but similar things. We have a things. huge overlap, yeah. Yeah, and like there was a – I wasn't in that headspace, so I had less urges to follow – in in those footsteps and like follow that message just because I saw it from a very different perspective of like I mean ICP is one that people talk about all the time of like all their bad influences because they're it's murder and they you know talk about like you know uh, getting high and shit like that and it's like their whole thing has always been forthright about like let us do that for you. You can yeah, take look. your, you know, when you put your headphones on, you can put your mind space there, but when you take them off, like you're back in reality. And like, that was a, they're just God the way clown hippies. Like they're, yeah, all, that yeah, was, yeah. I, that was the way I chose to approach music and in that, general after that, like horror movies and stuff. As I realized like, Oh yeah, this is just an escape from everything else. I appreciate all the think cool parts of things the ICP did now, but mm-hmm. back back in the day, that's why I fucking hated them. Yeah, like, yeah, that's, that's fair. That's that, fair. That's why, like, I wanted I wanted to listen to Brother Lynch Hung talk about killing and cannibalizing people and yeah. music about overdosing, committing crimes because that's like I I really wanted that. Like before, like there was like tons of information about like different artists like if i found out this rapper like cannibalized someone this is all i want to listen some, to some big lurch man i wanted to be a rock star or a serial killer like there was not much in between i just wanted to die and do drugs as a kid <laughs> Like, you know, most people want to be like a doctor or an astronaut. And, you know, since Steven's over here, like, I either want to murder people or make rock music, make hard shit. <laughs> Pretty much. I, I mean, I was, art, visual arts was a huge part of it too. But 
but there's no money in that. So no, <laughs> I not guess there's all. not really a lot of money in serial killer either. But <laughs> you spend a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, you spend more money than you make most. Yeah, <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think anybody's getting their own Netflix residuals on their story. No, they they had to make laws for that. I I think that was based off Bundy that they made those laws that you couldn't profit in prison from your your book deals on your crimes. Like, oh uh, yeah, it would go to the government or different charities and shit. Like, Mein Kampf is still sold on Amazon, right? But all that money mm-hmm. goes to Jewish charities and stuff. Like these different murder docs and all this stuff when it's a serial killer that's alive technically they would be making the you know the rights to their they'd be making all kinds of fucking money but it all has to mm-hmm. go to something to combat whatever media they're gonna put out basically right right it's pretty there's some interesting ethical i don't know hip hypocrisy or i don't know yeah there's there's many circumstances in, in a gray world that's not all black and white and goofy shit like that yeah i wanted to ask this question because i feel like this is a there's a lot of stigma involved in this the the term of functioning blank so like a functioning alcoholic like what that means to people or a functioning addict like what that means to people is very different based on a who's saying it mm-hmm. b who they're referring to in their relationship to them mm-hmm you know, when you say, oh, they're a functioning alcoholic, I think most of the time that's always like a, a slight um, of some uh, – just of like of some type, but it's like – but they're still functioning. Right. It's like they still – you know, they're not completely off whatever. So like what does that term mean to you? Like if someone says like, oh, they're a functioning addict, what does that mean to you? Well, I mean they're – for both good and bad, there's so much stigma – with drug use particularly like alcoholics have it easy in that sense it it sucks because alcohol is everywhere but at the same Mm -hmm. time you're you're judged so much less for it compared to having like needle tracks on your arms like shit like that but i think a lot of that's just because more people have experienced that yeah More, more people have fallen either themselves have gotten into a point where they were on the edge of being addicted or you know knew was friends or family with someone close to them who did reach that point. I just think they're more understanding of it. Like I quit alcohol, serious drinking before I was 18 because I was way more out of control and dangerous when drinking than I ever was heroin. Like heroin was going to be more likely to kill you, but alcohol was going to send me to prison for life. Like for me, alcohol was way way more unpredictable or scary. I don't think people that have never done drugs, like don't, they have no perspective on how fucked alcohol is, but Mm. I always, anyone who is not a homeless or in prison, full on junkie or alcoholic, they're all functioning, you know, they might not be functioning well and not a ton of them are, but anyone in the free world that has a place to hang their head at night is a, you know, functioning addict or alcoholic. So it's, it's so many different levels. Like you, you can be on dope or whatever, but if you're not shooting up, like you're probably not as bad as the dude who only can use needles and needs 10 times more and is homeless. Like there's, you know, so many fucking, it's all different levels of trash. Right? <laughs> and and you, you just kind of brought into the, one of the other things I wanted to touch on of the, the uh the heroin usage and like i as growing up i thought that the only way to do heroin was with a needle i thought there was in, with especially with many kinds of drugs there's only one way to do it and you can do almost any drug any way you can think of <laughs> yeah yeah put it up your butt Fuck works yeah fantastic certain um, drugs it bypasses the liver there's certain yeah. pills and like alcohol whatever like that's the way to do it. Like some mollies and shit like that. It's it's interesting. I, yeah, I, would, I definitely I definitely heard that with Molly. It's like if you want to you want to like really do Molly, like put it up your butt. I don't even know if that's true with Molly. I, but there were there definitely are drugs that is true with. But very few people. There's definitely some, but very pe- few people start 
heroin shooting it up. Um, especially now with, you know, like I, I go to, I'm on medication. I take Suboxone now. I've been on subs on and off almost a decade. And like now I just need a, you know, so a lot of people don't consider that sober, but I take a very small amount for me. It's fucking sober. I haven't been high in like four years or whatever. I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. But it, it, when I go to those clinics still, there are months at a time where no one pisses dirty for heroin. The Dr. Hart, this guy, I, I respect his work a lot. I think he's cool, but he wrote a book advocating for open drug use. And I mm -hmm. fully agree. But if, you, if you're poor and you live in Cincinnati, you can't just do heroin without consequences because there is no heroin to do. It, right. It, like when I started using heroin, it was heroin. And within like three years, it sh it phased out to the point that you could not find it anymore. Like people only are doing fentanyl now, they, whether they know it or not. Like there's, <laughs> there's probably, you know, a, ve a very small handful of people every year in Cincinnati that do heroin. It's all fentanyl. So like, you know, you can try to shoot fentanyl but until you already have a tolerance like you're probably overdose like a with a with a gram a day heroin habit i could shoot five dollars of fentanyl mm -hmm. and die like it all, all the rumors about people dying from touching it that shit is not true that's not a thing like even like a vice news and different i don't know different ab or alternative media still would report that like that is not a thing but the smallest amount injected or snorted like just can kill so many people so it, it most almost everyone starts snorting there's exceptions mm -hmm. but like i snorted heroin for years before i switched to the needle and the needle was always that thing at the end of the tunnel where you're like as soon as i start doing this you know it's over like the longer mm -hmm. you can put that off the the higher chance you have of living because as soon as you have to use a needle it goes downhill so fucking quick like e each time you do, it's like total roll of the dice and it just, the amount you need, everything completely, it, it's like doing a different drug. Like whatever drug you're doing, if you inject it, it's a different drug by comparison. Yeah, I can, I can absolutely see where it's like, you, you literally, it's mainlining. That's what they, they call it is mainlining. So yeah. when you just <clears throat> bypass everything and now it's in your heart, now it's in your brain, it's like. Dude, the prettiest it, – it, it's it's so, like, <laughs> classic ju junkie bullshit. But the prettiest thing I can, to this day, think of seeing is the red rose. When you hit your vein and you see the blood in the syringe, so you know you hit a vein right before you slam it, that is, like, every junkie's favorite thing in the world. The, like, that's the mad junkie shit right there. <laughs> dude, it's the, you, It's so beautiful. Like – if you're not super sick, you'll like, you'll like take a moment to be like, oh, that's beautiful. And like watch the blood twirl and then you like slam and then like hold on for the ride. Like that's like the moment. <laughs> that's the, the, the shot they always show in movies too. Of like, oh yeah. Yeah. Like you all, oh, this is Requiem. how you know. Yeah. For yeah, a dream, yeah. the eyes dilate. That's the moment. I had someone describe it to me as a uh, heroin is a, a warm Christmas morning laying under the tree. And like, <laughs> he told me that years before I used. And then like the, one of the first couple times I was like, this motherfucker was right. <laughs> it's More the Christmas feeling of morning. scissors gliding for hours. Yeah. <laughs> the perfect Christmas morning by the fire. Yeah. Laying under the tree, <laughs> mouth agape and foaming and <laughs> fucking, fucking OD and <laughs> by the presents. Now I've never OD'd on Christmas. I've, I've crossed off a lot of the other holidays. <laughs> I haven't done Christmas yet. We'll get there. What a present. What a good a good gift. So I, so this is this is the cynical part of me cuz like I feel like I kind of sound like one of the lame dudes at a meeting that was like this is how fucked up my life was and then I got sober and shit was better like I I'm like 4 years approximately but my goal is to go back to using. I do not want to be sober. Like I like fuck life. Fuck sobriety. I, I just, I need to be sober now. I need to get my shit together. But 
I don't want to die from old age. I want to die from shooting dope in my neck. That That is like, <laughs> that's the goal, God man. Damn. And like, it, it's crazy because no, the people that get sober, I was talking to Sarah the other day. Out of the hundreds of junkies, drug dealers, prostitutes, like whatever the fuck it was that I've known, I can think of like a handful of people that did fentanyl, meth, like whatever the fuck it was, like heavy shit that got sober or are alive mm-hmm. or not in prison. And I I can think of, I don't know if I can name anyone that is like sober past five years. Like everyone dies quick. There's like old school junkies that are like 60 and 70 that still shoot up that are like been in the game that long. Like they're, they're going to die that they're fine. Like they're just going to do their thing. But the, the kids we grew up with or like our generation, like everyone's fucking dead. No, yeah. no one lives or gets sober. Like you just die and you don't meet other like long-term sober people because everyone's disappeared or dead within a year of them using like to meet someone else my age that did heroin and fentanyl for f- five, 10 years was unheard of. Like I know there's tons of people out there, but you don't meet each other because you're you're so isolated or in that prison treatment or just dead. Everyone. Yeah. Dead. You, you are absolutely a very rare case. I, so, it's so confusing. Cause it doesn't like you, you, you hear it's everywhere all the time, but you only hear when people die. Like I, I don't, I never knew other people who did what I did. It wasn't like social for me. Like there was like one or two people, but that's it. Like, it was just something I did on my own most of the time. I think that's that. That's the key of it is that you only, you always hear when people die, and it's like you, you never hear a good story that starts with, and then I started using heroin. Except that one time I went to the opera. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good night. But yeah, it, it's it's invisible till it's like really off. It's like you don't see someone going through super hardcore addiction until they have the track marks until they're they're gone all the time or they're in prison or they're dead Mm -hmm. you're you're okay using until you're not and then you know like people don't get to see everything in between you you see them when they're okay and then you find out when they're not that's about it yeah yeah that's been a lot of the experience uh, from from my experience too when fent like when i started heroin was brown if you got heroin that wasn't tan or brown, you were pissed with your dude. That was like bullshit to get some like fake white china or something that didn't smell like heroin, like organic mm-hmm. from an op- opium shit. Like no within- pesticides, organic. <laughs> yeah, like shit from the Middle East, like real heroin. Within like two or three y- years of me first starting to use, it was all white gray synthetic fentanyl and that first couple summers cincinnati was like in one of the top cities like there was there was one summer and i knew a handful of people but 400 people overdosed in one summer as soon as fentanyl hit the streets there were like swat teams downtown there was d all these da bust and like people were just every week i'd go downtown vine street or whatever you would see people laid out all the fucking time. It was like fucking wild. A war zone. It's it's so wild how how that swept cuz you know, I guess when it's coming out like when people are getting it it's like I don't know. I I guess I don't understand the 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 ethics of it totally like not the ethics but like how it works totally but like there's one person that's bringing in a lot of that to an area. Like most people kinda. I assume like because it's not like every drug dealer is running down to Miami to pick up their shit. Like the one person is like it bringing changed. in, and they're they're you know it, there's a, a a delegation system. It used to be that way. the The new era, the the whole fentanyl era kicking off. I, there were times, I sw- if anyone knows the old blue light drug form references. When you're trying to talk about yourself, but you're not going to, you, you talk about swim, someone I know, or whatever. Yeah. Uh-huh. There were people I knew that you would just order shit online. Thousands of Valium pills or Russian steroids or fucking, uh, uh, what's the what's the one that makes your dick hard? 
uh, Viagra. Viagra. Like that was a great drug to sell because you weren't going to prison long and those pills could go for 50 a pill, like up to. So you could- Damn. Yeah, like they still cost like 20 a pill. Like there's, now there's like one generic or whatever. But if you were trying to hustle, you could, you could buy a thousand of those fuckers from a Mexican pharmacy, get sent to your house 10 times your money. Like you could buy, you could buy Chinese fentanyl openly on the internet. So it used to be like, you know, people would bring in a load to Florida or whatever and it would get cut up between a, small circle and eventually make its way to the city and then like that wave was just like open season everyone you know people started using the dark web but before that it was just you just could find shit you could find ways to get it online and people regular drug dealers were buying fentanyl batches from china because china didn't make it illegal they were trying to pump fentanyl to the u.s so it was just like I don't really know specifically like how much that actually is, just China. It was coming from countries in other parts of the world, supposedly China. And it was, people were just eating it up. All of a sudden, people had the most fire dope imaginable. And no one knew, like, for the first year, six months, like, most people didn't know what fentanyl was. Mm-hmm. It was just dope. The dope game was changing or whatever. And everybody was dying. And when someone overdosed, that's the shit you buy. That's the good shit. You buy what your friend overdosed on. That's fucked up. And fentanyl sucks compared yeah. to heroin. It's a million times stronger, but it's so much stronger. It doesn't feel good. No euphoria. It's like um. What do you so say? It's like it's like elephant tranquilizer or some shit. Like that's that's how a lot of them like car fentanyl. I believe was a elephant trank. I think that's what fentanyl was invented for. But it, a lot of them like I, I know ketamine. Ketamine's an animal thing. Yeah, it's. You know, one flake, like one piece of salt worth of fentanyl is something like the equivalent of like 200 milligrams of morphine. Like you could, and and it has a way shorter half life, you know, up to hundreds of times stronger per molecule than heroin or whatever, but it keeps you high and well for like a quarter of the time. So all of a sudden, the people that needed to shoot heroin once a morning before they go to work and they were like a functioning addict, it was now they needed to get high as soon as they got home from work too. They needed to Mm -hmm. shoot up during the lunch break too. Like this shit lasted so short and it, it, it just would knock you unconscious and not out, but you didn't feel good basically. That, that's the main reason I quit Mm because fentanyl sucks. (laughs) You mentioned ODing a few times. Um, Ten times a year for at least five years. <laughs> really? At least, yeah. Wow. Like once, that, once a month. What is it like? Uh, normally some asshole firefighter kicks you awake and calls you a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> or you wake up to cops tapping on your window. Because mo- most, unless you're so fucked up you're homeless or don't have a car, like you use a, most of your dope in your car or like, you know, when you get back home. So normally it's like you cop some shit and it's like, you're so sick. People don't understand how f- fucking bad being dope sick is. It's not an option to take the five minutes to drive home. You are dying. So mm. you shoot up in your car, you snort, whatever. And you wake up to someone finding you or, you know, warning you cops are coming or it's the cops themselves all the time. Wow. I mean, like, the feeling-wise, I guess, is it very different? Is it any different than using? Is it? Is it? Do you notice? Did, would you ever notice, like, beforehand, like, I'm, I might have already, I, I might, you know. Yeah, it's, you know, like, when you see people, like, slow, like, you know, some crazy fuck at the bus stop is not now doing like the zombie dance or whatever Mm -hmm. they're most of the time like they could overdose but it's more like they're just like super fucked up they keep going in and out when you overdose you don't overdose an hour later it's like i mean you can i guess depending on what you're mixing a match or whatever normally it it happens right away or you're okay if you make Mm -hmm. it a half an hour in or like you shoot up and you're fine 20 minutes later you're it's pretty rare 
you're going to overdose later. So ever, how, how often was that a thought when you used? Was it like each time was there a, the, the thought in your head of like, was that too much? Absolutely. No, we're cool. Absolutely. You'd wait, you know, 30 seconds in most of the time. And you could be wrong, but most of the time, 30 seconds in, you would have, you would think you know if you're okay or not. Mm -hmm. When I started, it wasn't that way. And then even when you knew it was fentanyl, you could think you know how strong it is. Like you could, I could snort half a gram of fentanyl some nights, but if I shot $5 worth, you still might die. Mm -hmm. it, it's like so unpredictable. The <clears throat> one one hundredth of the bag you're buying is fentanyl. The rest is cut. All it takes right, is a little right. bit clumping up weird or like just hitting you the right way. And you could maybe you even could snort a shit ton of it, not be that fucked up. And then you, you shoot and it, you just happen to die. Like it's most of the time injecting 30 seconds in or right after you take off your tourniquet or whatever the fuck you're using. If, if you make it 30 seconds, you're okay. If not, all of a sudden your vision going down a tunnel, you get these black speckles creeping in that, you know, mm -hmm. that shit, like when you're passing out, you might even have the thought like, Oh fuck. But before you can finish that thought, you you're already unconscious. You might know it's going to happen, but before you finish the thought, you're already overdosed now my the extent of my you know um like a regular drug use like the only thing that i use on a regular basis yeah. would have been weed when i would go to smoke weed most of the time it would just be like i'm gonna do a little bit to like get me through the next few hours or something like oh i'm just gonna I'm just gonna smoke a little bit it wasn't always like there, of course there were times when it was like i'm gonna fucking get ripped i'm gonna smoke so much yeah. fucking weed today or you know like the, like in the next hour i'm gonna smoke this whole fucking blunt to myself because mm -hmm. why not when you would use knowing the danger of of you know waking up to cops would you know was it ever like was it the same way was it like i'm just gonna do a little bit right now or is like was it usually a, like a I'm going to test the boundaries I mean, of like, you the know. The thing is, is like, it is that bad when you're shooting up fentanyl. But it, for like half mm -hmm. of my drug use, it wasn't that danger. It, it hadn't really came out like that yet. And then I also started mm -hmm. shooting like, you know, over half of my drug use in. So for me, it felt, for and my tolerance was so high. I was taking subs. I couldn't get high. I was always sick. I had all these different stages of it where there were times where I, I could just snort I, what I felt like an unlimited amount of heroin and not die. Like I felt that there were a couple other people mm -hmm. I knew that had a higher tolerance, but I felt like I could handle anything. There was no amount that could kill me and I could keep going forever until fentanyl really changed that much and even then i thought i could and then all of a sudden you can't so you know there were always people you were with that were like just just like most music of any genre is bad just like most bankers are bad just like most lawyer whatever most junkies mm -hmm. are pieces of shit or really dumb that's mm -hmm. super brutal but most of the people i used with fucking sucked and i i I'm sure I did it in my own ways too. I'm not saying I'm great, but there were always the people that were like, well, let's fucking party. Like, fuck this. We're going to do as much as pot, that energy mm -hmm. type of shit. And that they're going to shoot up half a gram of dope all at, all at once. And those are the people that die within six months of starting. Those people don't, don't mm -hmm. fucking last. And you know, the times I would overdose, I might have like got to a super depressed, suicidal place. But for me, it was never like a fun party. I hated everything. And this was like a cure. It would give me, you know, beautiful moments in my day when everything else in my life was absolute shit. I was, I was sick far more than I ever was high. But those moments every, you know, 10 minutes an hour every day, every other day where I'd be like 
in the woods, like just catching a nod, looking at a pond. That was like the best moments in my life compared to anything else going on. And that juxtaposition mm-hmm. between being sick and high, like going from feeling like you just want to die and kill people to like the most beautiful feelings, the best feelings you ever could have for the rest of your life. That, that instant change between the two is so fucking addictive. And so there's always people that are like going to go super fucking hard and they fucking die. The people that did it how I did most of the time, it's like you in the morning, you meet your dope dealer before work. And you space that shit out throughout the entire day. Even if you're not getting... Because most of the time you don't really get high. Like you're at your warehouse job and no one knows because every hour you're doing just enough in the bathroom to get through the next hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. You had touched on the, you know, chunkies are usually pieces of shit thing. And I think that's a stigma that goes with it, but I feel like it's thought of at least the way that i was kind of taught that mentality yeah, was yeah, yeah. different it's not like it's so like people that get into drugs like n- doesn't necessarily mean that they're pieces of shit but once they get to the point where they're dope sick all the time and shit and like they you know maybe they've lost their job eventually or they what you know whatever the situation they're in they're put in a position where committing crimes other crimes to get their next fix becomes a a viable option or a necessary option i mean i'm pro crime i don't think crime makes (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) exactly yeah pro pro crime podcast all right since that we had um i think it was brown county there was that sheriff running and his whole platform that's nearby since this dude's whole platform was we don't narcan people anymore he wanted, they just wanted all the junkies mm-hmm. in their little backwards ass town to die. That was his whole fucking platform. In Cincinnati yeah. and in most cities, the firemen and emergency services, 90% of their jobs nowadays is just overdoses. Ask any fucking fireman in a major city, they typically have gotten to the point where they hate drug addicts because their job of helping people and real emergencies is just narcanning addicts whatever yeah so when i say most people that are junkies are piece of shit i i don't mean it that so much of it is like you know like religious people or like institutions that actually hate people just because they are drug users users are using as a sin like i I hate that shit so much, but it is a reality though. And I don't think it's because of the crime that people do, but most people that are drawn to it just, I mean, I think most people are shitty in general, but a lot of people that have really fucked up lives that are really hard and shitty to be around gravitate towards drugs. And and we've talked about this before, like the people that keep going farther tend to keep doing crazier or worse shit or stealing, you know, stealing from the people yeah. that, that help them, their family, their loved ones. And they become, yeah, th- that's, that's more what it was for me. It was like being told, like, like if you keep fucking, you know, junkie steal. friends around, like they'll, yeah. they're, they're going to steal from you. It's just an inevitable that eventually, you know, you let them know that you've got nice shit and like, they're going to come take that shit at some point. The thing is, is that's pretty much true. It's like 99.9% of tr- true. You know, there's always going to be people that are yeah. like myself. There were times I acted against my morals. Like that that's what addiction is. Is like when you do something you don't want to do. Okay, it goes against your own right. your own morals. That that's what active addiction is. There were times I would do dumb shit. But if I there were people I really loved that were close to me, I really had like my own code of honor that and not that I didn't still do shitty stuff at times, but I really never would let it get so far that people would that I love the most wouldn't trust me. Like they they might not yeah. want to give me twenty bucks, but they didn't think I was going to rob their house right. because I I really tried to stay at, and it was really fucking hard. But I I was like a person of my word. I paid my debts. 
And I didn't steal from people I cared about. Anyone, the public was open season, but people who, you know, right, yeah, fight for the whole thing. Like addiction is a disease. You have no, you know, it's an actual physical problem. Um, I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to like ease the stigma and like give people options and like change, you know, give people help. But the, it's a fine line because it, we're always responsible for our actions. And some of that thinking gets farther away from accepting you did what you did. There's so many fucking people in mm-hmm. AA or whatever. Like they find God, the drugs made them do it. You know, they're with God now. Everything's different. Like that, that shit's garbage. Those people relapse and die always. <laughs> I think what's, what's an important ad- addendum to, you know, we're all responsible for our own, own actions What's an important afterthought is also we're not responsible for other people's actions. We cannot be held responsible for things that other people do. But what we can be responsible for is our reaction to those actions. I think that's a huge thing that people put in perspective when you – when you know, especially in a situation like that, like the church is like, oh, we're pissed off because they're – you know, like we don't like these people because they use drugs or whatever. But like what do you – doing to either help or what are you doing to like how do you react to it do you you know the reaction to it i think is the vital part of like you're not offering a solution you're not offering a change so you're just griping about some shit and then you know putting I it on someone agree else with that. what i when i capitalize on though is like when you first start that first time or whatever it is fully your choice to use or not use each time after that you are relinquishing some of your control it it really does become Mm -hmm. a physical disease but it and each time you're getting farther in it becomes harder and harder say no all that shit but you still always have the ultimate decision and and it's just to me, that's just really frustrating because there, like, I tried so many fucking times to quit. Like, I mean, every fucking day for years, right? But mm-hmm. and I and it felt out of my control. But in the, it always was my choice. I feel like when you think of it as like, I'm so far in, I have to do this. It's no longer my decision. You're already fucked. You might have given up the majority of your willpower along the way, but it's still, it's still always your decision. Or, or the other person, you know, when you're judging other people to say like, oh, we can't blame them. They're they're just a, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. they're the the local crackhead or heroin actor, or whatever. Oh, that's <laughs> just the local crackhead. <laughs> oh, that's just old Jimothy <laughs> Crackhead. Yeah, we don't, we don't blame him. It's just him. the drugs. Like, it's still him. Yeah. Drugs reveal who your true self is at some point or another. Like, it it might be that. You know, we should grant people way more empathy because we understand their will is diminished, but it's still, it's still their mm-hmm. choices. Uh, I don't know. I, f- yeah. I feel like defensive over that I mean, point because I feel like people either along the way always say like, you know, you're a full piece of shit, you know, or or like <laughs> you're an angel who the world let you became – affected by these bad substances you know there's no Uh, in between yeah i feel like i have to be the vanguard of being like no you're a piece of shit but it is pretty you know you weren't you were compromised you know yeah yeah there you've you said your your agency gets taken away from you yeah as you go yeah exactly i mean have you let me steven have you ever tried just saying no dude i remember have you ever tried just All saying no to drugs? Like we were taught One in middle school. One of the school. last times I didn't use, oh, I was so pissed. This is my buddy with the fucked up liver. Right, before, He went back to, to prison, I assume. He got like four new felonies. Like when you overdose, they give you like four felonies. Ridiculous. He overdosed at a drive through and they gave him a stack of new charges. But when you've been in the system enough, you, you, t- you don't really go to prison for being a hardcore addict much of the time unless you're selling and they catch you selling actively normally like you're in drug diversion programs 
or you do some prison time, or they put you in half, you know, you typically go somewhere um, by the order of the court with the, I don't know, prison looming over your head. But if you've been in drug court four or five, six times, whatever the fuck it is, like, you know, when you catch new felonies, you're just going back to drug court or a different rehab. And you could go to prison Mm -hmm. eventually, but the the prisons are too full. So they, they have to send you to drug programs. Right before he's going into this program, you know, I know he's going to rehab the next day, and he's like, I need you to help me cop. And it's like, you motherfucker. Like, you're an asshole. I've been in that position so many times where, like, I have no money, I'm broke, and I'm about to go somewhere tomorrow against my will, and no one will help me. No, Like, I'm dying sick. I know I'm going to rehab or to jail, whatever it is, tomorrow, and no one in the world gives a fuck enough to give me $20 or a ride so I just don't have to like feel like I'm dying for the next 24 hours. The last time mm-hmm. I, I went through that, someone helped a crazy amount. They, they helped me so fucking much. I will forever be grateful to them. I remember when my buddy came to me for that, like my only condition was like, just don't let me see it. I, I know you'll have it, but if I see it, I, I'm done. Right, a motherfucker. As soon as we get in the car, look at this. He knew what you know. He's about to leave for (sighs) rehab too. He knows like I could be out here tomorrow selling everything I have, like back in it. And it's like you don't give a fuck when you're using. Like you just you're so fucking lonely. You just want some. Even if it's only for the 15 minute car ride, you want the person you're around to be the on that same level with you. And it's like, I, I right. don't hold resentment, but man, that, that was like one of the few times. Yeah. That was a so shitty move. That was shitty. a dick move. Fuck you. <laughs> Piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> That's why your liver's why bad, you're motherfucker. Die in prison, you <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> Hope you never hear this because you're dead. <laughs> Died of pneumonia in a shitty Kent County prison. <laughs> God damn. What a way to what a way to go. I mean, I feel like that's uh, Yeah, that's just a dick move. Just an all I mean, I I absolutely 100% understand the perspective of like you want the people you want to feel yeah. a connection with the people that you're with of that like like you described earlier, it's like you don't see the people that are when they're doing it. It's like you're you feel alone almost kind of thing. So like when you are around someone that you feel like you can bond over this thing, you can form a, 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 a something that you might keep in like shame or something that you keep from like the rest of the world that you can share now with somebody that urge it's so is strong. Mean. Like to be able to like be yeah. when everyone in your life thinks you're a piece of shit or uh doesn't understand this like the most important part about your life if you have someone you can like whether it's you know a partner that you can lay in bed nod out together or of a, a friend that just got out of jail and you can like listen to music and drive one of you is up mm-hmm. get fucked up for a day like that is like the most meaningful shit in the world when your life is like already that askew that uh, that shit yeah you know, never last, but that those are like the only good times. When you think of like how all those years went, there's like certain memories of like uh, a interpersonal connection with someone that involved drug that was meaningful. That's the shit that stands out or those really sacred moments mm-hmm. alone, but normally they're with someone else. The, it's like, you, you also, you can't go, you know, you go buy your drugs from somebody that's like into the into the lifestyle, but you're like, what are you gonna do? Hang out with I've your hung dealer? Out with a lot of my dealers, but they're like, all. My, oh man, I gotta. I feel like that's th- that's probably pretty rare. On um, that. God, I I want to pick my words correctly. It's different with different drugs, but I can imagine that too. But for like sure. a huge part of the. With the heavier drugs, it's like 
you, you it gets to a point where you, you hate your dealer. They're a piece of shit. They treat you like trash. When you buy grams or like, you know, a tenth, that's what a 20 bag is, is a tenth of a gram. It, do, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter what it weighs. As soon as fentanyl came out, it, it, the weights are arbitrary unless you're in bulk, like big time in, right? Like you get whatever mm-hmm. they give you. Doesn't matter. Like if you buy $20, $100, it doesn't weigh <laughs> what its name says it weighs. It's, it's whatever. Right. Yeah. So, you, and, and you see these people every day and you give them all of your money and you, you both hate yeah. each other. You're cool with, you hang out with, them at times and shit but they hate you and you hate them because you're annoying as fuck calling their phone all the time that most of the time they're living in a shitty apartment have hella kids or some shit and you're just giving them enough money to get by and in exchange you're giving someone all of your money and they rip you off all the time so you're just constantly like yeah in this weird it's a codependent yeah. war. Dude, that's a great term for it. But there were there were some dealers that were super honorable, and then some that were like absolute trash. Like that would sell sell to you, knowing the cops are going to arrest you afterwards because they're watching, and they don't give a fuck as long as they get the money. They'll serve the people getting arrested all day. They'll give you shit that they know is cut with sand or oil or. What at glass, and then God you have other damn. dudes that will literally take you a bullet to give you a ten back. It's everything in in between, and they're always going to jail. And when they go to jail, it's normally for a while, and you just call their phone every day to see if it's turned back on, or you call their family's house to find their girlfriend to find to send them a letter to ask, you know, like it's like desperate yeah. shit. Hey, hey, I I tell him when he I need gets a out, I need a bag. bag 6 months from now. Please <laughs> tell him this. I like the I like to set an appointment. I might have the cash on me. We'll figure it out then. We'll cross it's that bridge when we come to shit, it. Man. We'll circle back vis-a-vis <laughs> at the 20 bag. <laughs> That's the thing is there's no limit to how much you can spend. And uh, until you die, your tolerance will always go up. $20 of fentanyl. Right can kill multiple people but once you're acclimated in that you need hundreds of dollars worth to feel okay or you you don't even get high off anymore you just feel sick until you use hundreds of dollars worth yeah that's fucked that's that that is that is the wildest part about it to me is that you you feel like uh um this was part of the drug court program thing I was in. I was busted with a small amount of weed. And because I was a teenager, they put us through a uh, teen court and uh, they had a, you know, sheriff come in and he explained how, you know, harder drugs work. And he was like, when you, when you take these drugs, you, you, you know, you start at a base level. And then when you take these drugs, you go up and you never come all the way back down. And you, you know, every time you, you use more and more, you just keep pushing more and more. And then you need more and more to get you back to this point. You need to take more and more. So you build up this level of, you know, uh, the tolerance that you're, you're taking and, and then what you need afterward. And at least from my understanding, that's why, you know, um, relapse overdoses yeah, happen. Yeah. All so much is like people, you know, right, go back yeah, to yeah. what they used to use after not using it for months and months and months. And then they, you know, they, they fucked around and found out the hard way that like, this is your tolerance is not what yeah. it used to be now. And you just fuck yourself Even knowing up that bad. if I, if I relapsed tomorrow, I'm not going to go buy a 20 bag, even though that should keep me high for a day or two. Cause my tolerance should be that low. It's actually still fucking high, but. If I relapse, I'm buying multiple grams. And my intention might only be to use 20 bucks a day, but half an hour into yeah. being high, that's out the window. Yeah. You're gonna, I'm going to try exactly. to use as much yeah, as yeah. I could use to use. I, I think, you know, junior year of high school was when I like was really into pills before heroin. And, you know, I could get faded out all weekend off five – uh, Vicodin, you know, like that could get you faded out for a day, mm. day and a half, whatever. Oxycontin, um, oxy, oxycontin, oxycodone, Percocet. It's like 
something like five to ten times stronger at least, right? 20 mm-hmm. milligrams of Vicodin junior year would get me faded as fuck. By senior year, I could take 500 milligrams of oxy functioning. The it, it changes so much faster than you think possible. Like I mix Xanax, mm-hmm. alcohol, weed, all that shit, take hundreds of milligrams of oxy, which you know started costing hundreds of dollars to the point where you just have to use heroin. I, I want to tell you about the one time I ever took a Xanax. I might have told you this already, but I, I took one. And then had not even a yeah. whole beer. And yep. then I woke up and it was morning. <laughs> Three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, I, no one told me that, like, oh, yeah, if you take Xanax and like you mix it with alcohol, like it, it's, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like it's, it's multiple times yeah, potentiated um, yeah. stronger than it. Every, every yeah, beer yeah, it's, is it's two beers wild. plus a Xanax, you know, like, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I probably don't bring it up as much of it has been a part of my life, but Ben, and that's like I still have all these memory and time issues. I've talked about time so much on this fucking podcast because I f- feel displaced mm-hmm. from time. But I mean, I took for ten years. I took Xanax at least two thirds of those days. I took benzos every fucking day, up to large amounts where I, I was. You know, I would say, you know, out of the 10 years, there's more than one year if that is fully blacked out, going to school, work, whatever, like, shit is so Mm. fucking much, so much stronger than people understand, like, just a basic clodopin script for anxiety. Like, when you, dude, it's crazy. The latest study on opiates from a surgery, if you go to the doctor, hospital, you have a surgery, basic surgery. Could could even be getting your molars taken out. If you are given two weeks or more of any opiate script, including Vicodin, if they give you Vicodin for two weeks straight and you take it for two weeks, the latest statistic on that was you have an over 95% chance of being addicted to opiates for the rest of your life. Or in, or in, until you get wow. sober, right? Pretty much ninety five percent of all people, if you do any opiate for two weeks straight, you're addicted indefinitely. It's it's got some hooks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's some wild shit. That's why it's so hard for me to fucking get pain yeah. pills right now. But I mean, I I've gone to multiple doctors complaining about kidney stone pains and like I like telling them like I want them to die. I get them randomly. Can I just get some so that I can have them around? And then they're like, it won't oh, no, help you can, though like, with kidney some. stones, right? It no, sucks, yeah, but- yeah, no, yeah. They were they were like, here, yeah. here here's some ibuprofen. You just go take ibuprofen, it's ibuprofen, like, oh, fuck and yourself. Then, uh, Tylenol, mix them. Yeah, yeah, it sucks because ki- yeah, there's. It's like, let me just get some Norco's, man. Come on, man. Might not let me just, dull the pain, but at least have a buzz. As well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like well, the Norco's so have um, and Vicodin. Yeah. acetaminophen. Yeah, yeah Tylenol. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's got that I in would, it. I like, would, I got to the point, like, if somebody would get a whole script for their molars getting pulled out, they might get 50 of them for two weeks, right? I would buy that script off people or whatever. I would cold water extract the entire prescription, like all 50 of them. And you you basically like, you grind all the pills down, you f- put them in water, you microwave them, then you freeze it and then run the liquid through coffee filters and shit. So You're making basically cold you get all of the Tylenol out of it and just keep the, the Vicodin, the the hydrocodone, right? And it's in a liquid. I I would drink that whole prescription all at once because if you that's but fucking and sometimes insane. it would get me high, and other times it wouldn't. Because if you're addicted to to fentanyl, that entire bottle of Vicodin is a, a very small dose of a small amount of fentanyl mm-hmm. or heroin or oxy or whatever the fuck it is. Like it, the returns are so crazy from. The heavy shit to a small shit. 
Now, here's what's wild to me. So this person just got their molars taken out. And now they sell they sell their script. What do they get in replacement for that? Because Nothing. for them, like, like that would be a time that right. I, I mean, like, everybody what, takes like like if they weren't like a druggy kid, they would take the Vicodins for like two days or whatever, and then their parents would want them to stop, or they they would they're like, oh, it makes me nauseous, or I don't like feeling that weird, and then they'd <laughs> sell it to the kids that do drugs for like a price that was way less than they were worth, and then I would snort them all. <laughs> <laughs> they, would, they would sell them to the druggy kid and then i would snort people's them <laughs> teeth getting pulled out got me high many a time <laughs> <laughs> like you suddenly become friends Everyone. with uh some kid oh. that you never talked to before after they just got their wisdom teeth. there were so many people like, like years <laughs> after school that would call me whenever they get a surgery or something because it was <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I know somebody who wants Dude, these. <laughs> I was I was so on. Unha- I would send out like I would collect people's numbers. I would broadcast a text to like a hundred people at a time. Like need pills. <laughs> Can you find drugs? What kind? Any? <laughs> like off a trap phone. Done. Yeah. Done. Deal Whatever choice, man. Get, I need to make some. I need to either get it or like find a way to make money. Like. I'm trying to have a farm oh, party yeah. over here. Yeah. I used to have my favorite straw that I would snort all my drugs through. <laughs> and when the straw would get so clogged up of everything, I then would have a day. It was typically like with my partner at the time. We'd get that special pen mm. and scrape it out and then get whatever the fuck was in it, get fucked up on it. And it was crazy. That is it would that's be like fucking a insane. Hybrid drug that's like of that's like the, used for the last six months or whatever. That's such an extreme version of like scraping the resin oh, out of yeah, your bowl and smoking sure. it. Like that resin, it, it was a real bad taste, but man, it gets you yeah. some fucked up. But man, that's that's so fucking extreme of just a fucking uh, a concoction, well, a, a it cocktail was stupid of too because if. I was always worried of getting pulled over with with my gear, and it, if like they have a straw yeah. full of thirteen different drugs or whatever, you're getting charged for thirteen felonies. And I was always like, "Yeah, I probably shouldn't <laughs> keep this one yeah, straw." Probably on shouldn't me all have the time. <laughs> well, I do crimes, yeah. <laughs> but it's my favorite. It was it's polka my favorite dot. Straw. It was black with pink, blue, and like purple <laughs> polka dots, and it felt so cool. I had the whole setup, you know. You know when you have your own specialized gear, you're going pretty far in. When you got special straws, baggies, glass pieces, the I would have my favorite CDs to snort shit off of. You have a whole like little factory operation from getting the dope in your hand to crushing it and snorting it (laughs) as quick as possible. (laughs) But I know I was uh, I was pretty happy with myself a few years ago. I bought myself a, a. a little utensil kit with, um, you know, a, a reusable, you know, like a fork and a spoon and stuff. So I wasn't using as much plastic wear and whatnot. <laughs> you know, that's that was my advancement in uh, in the world. And I never thought – I mean, it did come with a metal straw. Actually, I take that back. It's got two straws in it. It's got the, a straight one and a curved one. Ooh. I wouldn't snort drugs with either one of them, though. Dude, I got one of those. Too thin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, trying to use the coffee straws was a pain in the ass. <laughs> you got to get the milkshake straws from UDF, bro. Those big pink chunks. Yeah, them big, them big fuckers. Oh yeah, get all chunks of shit through that. Fuck yeah. <laughs> the um, I feel like I'm just glorifying drugs and suicide. <laughs> yeah, what's this is uh, this is our podcast? What are you talking about? That's what we've always done. <laughs> the um, I feel like there was um. There was something you said earlier that made it maybe want to circle back. Yeah. Oh, you said uh, the honorable drug dealers, and and I was gonna ask about that until you started talking about like them putting sand and oil and shit in it, and you're know, like, oh yeah, okay, I can see where people that don't do that, they're considered honorable. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, there, there's there's always a few dudes, right? The type of dudes like you develop enough trust that. 
they know they're looking out for you. If they know they got a sketchy batch, they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you to be careful. If they know the cops are there, they're going to tell you to wait, loan you out money because you've proved you can pay it back. Times where like your cars broke down, they know how to fix a car. Like there's times where like you develop real relationships with people and it just Mm -hmm. so happens they have something you need. The thing, it's just rare and it typically doesn't last whether they eventually like break that trust or you break it. I mean, most of the time it's, you know, the user who pays their dude in Monopoly money Mm -hmm. and makes off with, you know, a handful of something and then that bridge is burned. There's, there were dudes I know that would just, their whole livelihood was just robbing dealers. Right, you you yeah. you go around picking up. You go to a different city and do it, or you go around driving downtown, having dudes hop in your car, and then they s- sit back on their seat and you fucking choke them up with something and rob your dealer. Just rob random dealers. Like there were dudes that did that every day. So someone's always gonna break the trust. So it was really hard to have good, legitimate connections with people where you felt like. You were safe with each other, and you could depend on each other. That shit was rare, but there's always somebody out there that's like a good person, but desperate and not, you know having to do something they don't want to do. And you know, it just it's so much more gray than people realize. Some some of the d- dudes I've known that have dealt more death than most people were like some of the coolest, nicest dudes that primarily not entirely but primarily were the head of their household just by selling like that's the reason they did it uh, right and, and you know like i said earlier most most people are shitty so that's not like it's not like a bunch of honorable dealers out there but there's some for sure i think the yeah i think that there's a the the, the b side of that the side of like because there are so many people that, you know, that that would rob you kind of thing would, I think it's inevitable, would turn people to like, I don't want a connection with you beyond like you come out, you know, you come and go, yeah. yeah, come and go pay, pay me money. I give you this. And then we part ways immediately, you know, or, you know, the tendency to like be violent or like be against like, to, if, if nothing else, but to, you know, put up a front of like. Don't, don't fuck even with me. Yeah, yeah. do not fuck with me. That's how it is for open air drug bar. I've talked about it before. Cincinnati's changed. Downtown, certain streets just open air market. That that's where you went. Dudes on every corner, block kids running shit for the dealers. Like that that was the you know, we don't talk hand to hand, money to money, in and out, it's boogie type of shit. But most of the time that shit's consistent, but it's typically consistently shitty. Yeah. You might get some really good shit, but it's risky. You're exposed. There's cops. There's other people that might want to rob you. There's more bad dope than there is good. Mm-hmm. Ideally, you're forming relationships through that or whatever where you got a dude you call or you go to their house every day. And a lot of times what happens is like you can't be in – walking in and out of someone's house every day. Yeah. You got to stick around for a little bit. And that's typically through circumstances, you're, you're being forced to spend more and more time around people you dislike and you're bending your morals more and more for them or actually connect with people that way. I lost like all social interaction when I got out of the game and shit. Like it was like, well, fuck, I'm never going to talk to anyone again. Like, that's how yeah. all of my whole life was based around those interactions of helping each other <laughs> find a substance. Yeah. I, I imagine that's, like, necessary, though. If you're really trying to, like, yeah. if your whole thing is, like, I'm trying to get clean. I'm trying to, like, get off of the shit. Like, you have to separate all ties. I didn't. I did with a lot maybe even most but um typically you know the first thing on the aa or whatever for that shit is like change your geography move leave the city go yeah. someone you don't know any connects get rid of your phone if you can't give up your phone and your keys you're not willing to get sober that's 
level one basic shit. If you're trying to help somebody get sober, they won't give up their phone, keys, bank account. They're not getting sober. They don't want to. You you do have to like change all those relationships, connections. Uh, just how I am. I didn't, I'm not about burning everyone just because I'm doing something different. Mm. But I, you know, I had to establish completely new boundaries. And if people weren't cool with that, then I, you know, would burn them. But it, it is a massive, like your life has to change a lot. But for me, that wasn't a big deal or hard. But you know, I, I assume there was like a like like you kind of described like there was a a, a a vetting process, kind of like a weeding out process of like for sure, like you said, like you you know have to tell people like oh no, I'm I'm not using it anymore or whatever. Like most of the time, it's you just stop talking. Ninety percent of the people you don't give a fuck if you ever talk to again. So like, yeah, yeah, people yeah. go missing or just drop off or phone numbers die all the time, and they may or may not show up show back up or or there were times like we would know like it's someone in one of those circles or whatever like their phone's not been on for a month they're trying to get clean they'll they'll be back like whatever yeah yeah that's depressing yeah yeah (laughs) dead or they'll be back in a week (laughs) right yeah that's the uh you know dead or in jail thing man that's uh yeah that was a, a thing i was just talking to somebody earlier about um, my, my sister was, a a thing and they were like, you know, cause I, I talked to, I talked about her before and it was like, what, you know, like, do you know where she is? And, and they were like, I was, I said, no, I, I dead her in jail. It's just easier to think that way because it's, you know, it's inevitable kind of thing. And like the, the only time we ever hear about her is when something bad happens or like she's doing some dumb shit and it's. It's just easier, an easier frame of mind to just know that that's that's the case because that's what's coming. Most likely. But, dude, it's crazy, man. I will say, like, you know, I'm going to contradict myself a bit compared to earlier. Like, 99% of people die, disappear, whatever. But, man, you see people survive, end up at sober facilities or whatever in their 40s, 50s all the time. And maybe they don't ever get completely sober, like, shit's still fucked up, but the longer people live, the more likely that they have a chance of turning mm-hmm. around. As bad as it can get, There, people make crazy recoveries, even if it doesn't last, or it's crazy fucking rare. You just never know for sure. Yeah. But I, I very much understand, like, adapting the mindset because you, you you have to yeah you know, you know she was she was on some wild shit before she was you know using shit so it's it's not like that's the main reason that I that we that I that I think that way but I understand um, yeah 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 sure her yeah she's fucked the, <laughs> the uh, I think I had one more question for you um, you were talking about dealers and stuff. Rule number four in the 10, 10 crack commandments, uh, I think rule number one, I think most people would say among, you know, when you're dealing shit is uh, never get high in your own supply. Did you find that to be, was that generally a truth? Like, did you, did you ever meet, a, you know, uh, dealers that were also using? So I, I've kind of avoided this aspect, but I feel like this, this, uh, I feel like I can make it appropriate here without sounding too weird. If all right, white heroin dealers are pretty rare and they don't typically last. Um, normally, if your dude's white, he uses his own supply. <laughs> that's <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's kind of because they're more just like a middleman. Um, generally, dealers don't use the hard drug they sell. But the thing is, is like. If they stay in the game long enough, they often will slip up. But the thing is, is like that is like so stigmatized to be to be a dealer using dope in those circles. If you're using your own shit, your own gangs, groups, whatever aren't gonna fuck with you. So like, um, God, it's so complicated to talk about in a way, but. Everyone's using something. It, it yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I imagine there's there's something going on, but it was like 
I, I think I imagined it like exactly like you said, like they're not using the hard shit they're selling. Like they're using something for sure. Like there's, there's, they're, they're doing Coke occasionally. Yeah. And they're, yeah. They're drink, they're drunk a lot or smoking constantly. But, uh, typically, you know, the average heroin dealer is not going to be using heroin. The guys that you might go to, if it's a guy, you know, it's a middleman, they might be, but, the guys moving grams, ounces, pounds, whatever, like they're not typically fucking with that. They're they're there to get money and use other drugs. Yeah. I think one of the, the hardest uh rap lines that I heard when I was young and just getting into rap was a three six mafia song where he says Yeah, I sell white, but I still do white. It was just <laughs> Like oh shit, he he flip flip the whole script on the don't get high on your own supply. Coke dealers typically do their own coke, so, uh, meth and meth crack heroin, meth they still do a, a decent amount. But thing is, is like dudes sell both nowadays too. And if you do heroin long enough, you get a bag of crack for free. Like at some point, when you're in far enough, you're mixing all the shit. You shoot your heroin with crack, with vodka, right? Like you're totally spun out. You're going through multiple addictions and withdrawals all at once because one day your dude didn't have dope, but he had crack. And that's like, you're fucked because you're you're just like so willing to do anything to ease how sick you are that you're just like, fucking, I'm about to shoot crack, heroin, speed, whatever, fuck it. It's fucking wild shit. Yeah. Can you shoot crack? I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Now, here's here's the real shit. <laughs> if you use fentanyl, how do I frame this? I, <laughs> You know how in the movies and shit, people cook their dope, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You, you're, you're doing that to get rid of impurities, and then you soak it up through a cotton. Mm -hmm. So that way any like random dirt or like Tylenol, like random shit in it, you're not putting directly in your veins. Like snorting it might be fine, but all that shit directly in your veins, infections, endocardosis, whatever whatever the fuck, like you can die. The wrong shit is cut. With heroin, it boils differently than fentanyl. But if you're getting like real fentanyl and, and heroin, when you boil it, you're, you're, destroying the drug heroin it was organic it made more sense to like get the pure syrup of it mm -hmm. and be willing to lose a little bit but most fentanyl this is like dangerous as fuck this isn't smart when you you get far into fentanyl there's no point of cooking it because it's just a synthetic powder with mm -hmm. like cut so you're just putting it in water cold water in a spoon or whatever the fuck and pulling it through cotton and just slamming it cold. That's like, I feel like for me, that was a revolutionary game changer. Because in the in my head, you think of heroin as like, oh, they cook it and they're, they're getting it safe and stuff. But it gets to a point where you're like, this shit is just like death powder and we don't even cook it. We just slam it cold, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> God damn! <laughs> Draw up some pond water if you don't got a water bottle. Mix it Jesus. with some dirt powder. And there's a fucking there's a fucking rain puddle out here on the street. Let me just pull. <laughs> Dude, I think I did that. I I don't know if I did it one time, but I remember it was like a like a fundamental moment where it was like, am I this desperate or not? And I remember I spent so much time, so sick, but I don't, re I don't know if I ever did it or not. There were times I watched people do that and it was like, yo, I would never, ever do that. And then you get to a point where like, you're fucking, you're mobile I and do this? <laughs> you're, you're near a public pool and you're like, well, yeah. ma maybe I'll go in here and get a, get an Aquafina from the vending machine. You get and realize I don't have a dollar. Yeah. And you just that, scoop up that chlorine water. And just, dude, that is a hundred percent reality though. That's and it's like, one. you'll, you'll sit there for 15 minutes. Am I, can I make it home or am I about to do this? That shit is the stuff I feel like you remember later where you're like, if you get sober, you're thinking about that type of shit. You know, so where you, you pushed your morals and you pushed your so far where you even to the point where whether it happened or not doesn't matter but knowing you you could be that desperate 
where five years ago you would never do something like that. You would you would think you you're the biggest fucking loser, piece of shit, whatever. Five years later, you're you're willing to do whatever mm-hmm. after you've done like that many fucked things way past what you would have been willing to do. You start thinking like that you don't want to do it again. Or for for me, it was it really was just. So I wasn't scared of the overdoses so much, but it was just prison. Prison's mm-hmm. the only re- I I got scared of prison because fuck that shit. Yeah, it's too much. I've never never been. I'm good on that. I don't need to go. There was there was it's you know, scary. <laughs> yeah, like growing Actually. up there is. I feel like there was always a romanticism of like going to prison or like going to jail, and it's like yeah, yeah. You know, it's like you get. You get old enough to to a point where you realize, oh no, like you're not supposed to want to go to jail. You're not yeah. supposed to want that. That's bad. It's not it's cool bad at to all. go to jail. You, you know who goes to jail? Bad criminals that got <laughs> caught. Like if, if you're their whole thing is like, oh, like I'm gonna you know get into crime and do crime shit. Like if you're a good criminal, you don't get caught. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's really cool to get your first felony. Those are the dudes like, oh shit, they got their felony. Like. That was like the thing, like, oh man, I'll get mine one day. I'll go to yeah. prison for, yeah. and then yeah. you, and then you catch a couple felonies, and you're like, oh my god, I never want to be here again. Like, I'm, I'm so stupid. Why the fuck did I think this was cool? It's crazy. Because some person. other fucker is, you know, some stupid fuck was telling you, oh yeah, it's cool shit, man. <laughs> Like, oh, they're hard. They went to jail. And it's like, it's no, like, they're a fucking idiot. They went like to jail. They, their family was hungry for two years because they went to prison. Cool, yeah. Dude. It's like, yeah. And that, Everyone around them suffered a little bit, at least, <laughs> because they went to jail. That could be me someday, man. Yeah, that could be me, man. <laughs> Super cool shit. Oh, uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think that's a good message to go out on. If you're going to do crime, do it good. Get away with it or don't go. Yeah, jail. don't get caught. That's the number one. <sighs> Fuck jail. Fuck jail. I'm, I was in a holding cell for-, for That's all. Uh, That's as far as I went, too. Yeah, I was in the jail, the holding cell for like uh, like eight hours or something. I, I, I used my, uh, my shoe as a pillow, and there was one corner of the room yeah. that they couldn't see from the door that was obviously the piss corner. Isn't that great? Was that at the JC? Um, no, it was at the fucking county jail in Florida. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's how Cincinnati's is too. They're so overrun. The pods are just in the center room of other pods where everyone sleeps on the concrete. Yep. Yeah. You'd use your shoes as a pillow. They photographed every fucking tattoo, opened every hole on your body. Like, it's like... <laughs> Crazy. Oh, they didn't open my holes. <laughs> Did, they, I, well, also, I was 17. So. <laughs> you got people in the psychotic states just like losing their shit. Like, fucking the Hamilton County Justice Center is a scary fucking place if you're there against your will. Uh, I, I think that, like, for overdosing, they were, they gave, they raided my apartment. This is all shit I can't get charged for already. Got leniency, whatever. It's a double jeopardy, baby. <laughs> they raided my apartment when I overdosed, and they gave me four or five felony possessions with like aggravated shit. And uh, they, I mean, they didn't even get everything. And they're, they're mm-hmm. you know, they're willing to give you six to 10 years, like for overdosing. They found it's like, hey, you know your life is like real bad right now, and you're tr- struggling with with a bunch of shit. Here's a bunch of more problems that make your life worse. It's like I, I know you just died, and we had to revive you yeah. for a couple hours with like <laughs> intensive medications and you know near surgery. But let's send you to jail and uh, make you think about it for a decade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and I wasn't selling like at that time. I was so fucked up. I was I wasn't. It didn't have any bulk or anything. It was like just a handful of personal things. That's a decade for. What Damn. The fuck. They, they, like I said, they're so overcrowded. They don't want to send you for it. They just, it's all, you know, just to force you to be on probation for a long time. Yeah. Feels good to be free. Fuck prison. Fuck prison. <laughs> I think that's a good place to, to call it and wrap up out of here. Yeah. I'm curious how much of this I feel like I have to delete or not. Yeah, <laughs> that's see. fair. 
I don't if know. It's uh, I all like cuts and I I, I want to hear how many bleeps and bloops and. I didn't talk about any specific crimes. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I, that was the I, one I, I I wanted to try to stay away from that. Because I mean, I really just used like I saw a shit ton of violence. Definitely was privy to some things, but I just wanted to get high. There was so much violent shit around me, but you know, most people using like or dealing are just trying to to get high. Like they're not. Mm-hmm. There's very few real, and then the violent people typically get caught anyway. So <laughs> I'm babbling. No, I was gonna say, you know, on that point, like, do you have any uh, any? final uh expressive words from um your extensive wisdom shouts out to my boy he's still on the streets and little <laughs> and uh <laughs> who else? i'm trying to think i know he's still out there i still see him out there every fucking day downtown every fucking day he's got 10 balloons in his mouth every motherfucking day <laughs> <laughs> you're about to caught <laughs> well, that's the thing it's downtown it's funny it became like a meme a heroin dealer meme <laughs> it's like uh, no, no, no. Literally, a, a local heroin dealer meme <laughs> there's like literally 10 different <laughs> downtown they all took the same name <laughs> <laughs> that is a that is a fine street meme <laughs> that's that's pretty fucking good <laughs> it's pretty funny I think that's it. Uh, I don't know what we're doing next week, but it'll be chill. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We we got uh, episode 100 next week. Oh, uh, yeah. We a whole a whole uh, 100 years of Trash Cats Trash Cast. God, that's fucking wild, dude. Yeah. Can't believe yeah. we stayed on it. For 100 full years. It's pretty crazy. The 200 more. Yeah, the 200 <laughs> more. But no more after that. 300 is the last one. Three years. 300 years is all we can have. Yeah, th- yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's get it. Yeah. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Thank you to Approaching Human for the use of his music. You can find his work on SoundCloud at Approaching-Human. Thanks, Chuck. Make sure to check out the show page at Trash Cats Trash Cast on Instagram for news and arts from the show. Uh, also, check out Facebook for the memes. Ah, oh, man. I just mentioned my brother. Now Now I feel sad. I'm just going to say, John's always – that's my dude, man. Love you, John. He all, No matter how fucked up shit was, he always had my back. Same with the – I don't want to mention everybody by name, but appreciate you. Yeah. You're included. And then, uh, what the fuck am I supposed to say at the end? Um, if you're super bored, you can check out my trash yard on Instagram at SkyZix, S K Y Z S E X. And you can catch uh, a buzz on it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then check out House, really cool on Netflix. And then <laughs> check out NLE. <laughs> the NLE <Gunna>. Choppa. <laughs> I think it's gonna. I forget. But yeah, whatever. Check them out. Funny stuff. Um, that's I did it. put down here uh, shouts out the drugs. Without drugs, we wouldn't have this episode. For sure. Without it drugs, is, Steven wouldn't be here. That's This is the slimy white underbelly episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you type that, and the first thing I thought in my head was it should be a slimy white boy. <laughs> <laughs> that could be either one of us. 50 50. Tune in next week. We, we'll have something up. Something up. We, something. we don't have uh, any plan for a hundred to you know really celebrate it but you know we'll we'll still have an episode next week fuck yeah that's gonna be all for us today stay classy eat trashy go fast eat trash go fast shoot trash (laughs) go fast and shoot trash in your veins (laughs) and then don't get caught just a hell of a mother (laughs) go fast inject trash (laughs) (laughs) oh god damn it